trying to do everything's coming through. Okay. Um, I have discovered that it's a very sensitive uh, mute button, so um, a couple times I think we were broadcasting when we weren't supposed to be. I hope it doesn't turn off when we're not supposed to. So uh, kind of give me a signal if things don't go right with this. So anyway, we'll begin with our announcements. Um, if anyone would like to make a floral arrangement, be placed up in our sanctuary, or to sign up for one of our Sunday morning chat and coffees, or to let us know about a favorite Sunday hymn, as they always say, the sign-up sheets are over there. If anyone would like to purchase gift cards for Stop and Shop or Big Y, wow, I've never seen Linda not there before. <laughs> um, so we can do that with Linda. And uh, also Mary McCarthy is off at a birthday party today, but you know that she is uh, collecting for the Relay for Life for Hampshire County. I'm also attending a talk this afternoon at Congregation B'nai Israel, I hope I'm saying that correct, B'nai Israel, uh, it's in Northampton, that will be taking place at 3 p.m., and it's designed to explain the campaign to ban nuclear weapons uh, to churches and to other groups that might consider signing on. Um, if anyone else from this parish would like to attend with me, please let me know. Uh, the main presenter will be Dr. Ira Helfand, and so that will be this afternoon at 3 p.m. This after tomorrow evening at 7 to 8 o'clock, we'll have our Bible study group where we are talking about still Mark's gospel. And also on Friday at our sister church, Edwards Congregational in Northampton, gospel recording artist Vanessa Willis will be in concert on Friday at 7.30 p.m. And Sharon and I are planning to attend. It's a free admission, but donations will be accepted to benefit the Children's Advocacy Center. And also, there's still a little bit of time, but the Hampshire Association annual meeting will be held at South Church in Amherst on Sunday, May 6th from 2 to 5 p.m. And anyone at all in the church is invited to attend, uh, but please let me or Head Deacon Amy know if you are interested. Maybe we can share a ride. And they do want to have a, a kind of an estimate of how many people from each church will be attending just so that they can make their plans as well. So if you'd like to go to the Hampshire Association annual meeting on Sunday, May 6th, please let one of us know. Also, there is a roast pork dinner planned for Saturday, May 12th, and I think, Sue Gilman, you have the clipboard I heard or something? No. You do. Um, I don't have it, but Amy Novak is going to be here by about 10.30, and she will have the clipboard. Okay, she has the clipboard to sign up for volunteers to work. Gotcha. And our tickets, tickets are not yet available, correct? Okay. All right, and Jonathan Barber, do you want to say anything about our new sound system? Yeah. You want a portable mic that we now have? <laughs> Microphone. There we go. All right. So I'm just tapping on uh, what the Reverend said. Now we have a new sound system in the church. Um, people over on this side haven't been hearing too well because the speaker was uh, not working. We found out a broken wire in the basement. But now we're up and running. We have a uh, Wi-Fi, so the minister can actually go down and talk with you. Be right there, and everyone can hear. We have the wireless mic. And also, we have uh, hearing assist. So if anyone needs, uh, is having a hard time hearing even with the speakers working, let me know and I'll set you up. We are having a little bit of difficulty right now. Anything new with technology, you know, we have to get the worms out. And we'll, we'll make it work, but uh, hopefully everything's going and we got a few other things we're gonna work on, like setting up the camera um, direct with the uh, system so everyone can hear. And if anyone would like to help donate to this project that we did, uh, you can see me or Keith, thank you. Thank you, Jared. Also, Amy, you're our reader today. Just so that you have a heads up, that mic is not on. When you go up, there's a little button. You just have to turn it on, uh, and you'll, your mic will go live at that point. All right. Um, I do want to continue mentioning that if anybody would like me to come to their homes for a visit, as a pastoral visit, uh, please, I, I'd love to come see all of you, so please just extend the invite, and I'll be glad to stop by and say hello. So, are there any other announcements from the congregation? Yes. Um, I feel Maddie, what are you? I'm the big bad wolf. You're the big bad wolf. <laughs> okay, Maddie's the big bad wolf. Yes? It's the morning I received the call from Marsha Shannon, and she wanted, again, to express a thank you for all the cards and prayers and um, cards um, and makes it feel good. And we'll, we'll pray for him later in the Mass as well, Gene and her husband. 
Yes. I just wanted everyone to know that we have a new great grandbaby. It was born Friday. Uh, Jeremy and Nicole uh, Bolda had a, a baby boy, uh, Jackson David. Well, congratulations, congratulations. <laughs> Any other announcements? Okay, then our guest organist this morning is Marla Zippe. Zippe. And the prelude for this morning's worship is O Sons and Daughters, Let Us Sing. And it's by Jean Francois Dandru. Okay, that's what we're going to go with, Dandru. <laughs> Draw together the fragments of our busy 
lives around the central core of love which you provide, that we might support one another. Grant us a fuller sense of what is right and good, and help us to live at our best. Amen. And please let us join together now in hymn number 227 and singing of In the Garden.
we want to give God the best kind of stuff that we can, but if the best is not defined by a dollar sign, the best is defined by what we have in our heart. So we always want to try to give our best to God. We also respect what others do so well that we applaud them, and maybe we can try to do a little bit better in imitation of them. So when you hear that story of Cain and Abel, don't just think about the murder. Think about the, the message behind it. We want to give our best to God, not a bunch of weeds. Okay? All right, guys. Have a great Sunday school class.
99 today is your birthday? Sweet lady from Sunderland, 99 years old today. Wonderful. Beautiful. Congratulations to Jenny Damara. Any other? Okay. Oh, yes. Cindy. I'm not sure, did I hear it? Did your mother have emergency surgery on her heart on Monday? Yeah. Oh wow, she's doing well. Yeah, she's right. Okay, she's already home. <laughs>
made everything that he could because of each and every one of us. May these gifts help us to build this church and also to build your kingdom in the world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us join now in song as we sing together from Red Hymnal number 188, Joy Dawned Again on Easter Day. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All of the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portico called Solomon's Portico. Utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us? As though by our own powers of piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of piety, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one, and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, who God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by the faith of his name, his name itself was made this man strong, whom you see and know. And with faith, it is through Jesus has given this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this, this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out.
And our gospel reading for today is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. And while they were still speaking about all of this, Jesus himself stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be unto you. In their panic and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus said to them, Why are you disturbed? Why do such ideas cross your mind? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is really I. Touch me and see that a ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. They were still incredulous for sheer joy and wonder. So he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of cooked fish, which he took and ate in their presence. And then he said to them, Recall those words I spoke to you when I was still with you. Everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day, and in his name, repentance for the remission of sins is to be preached to all the nations, beginning here at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses to all of this. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So tomorrow is Patriots Day. It's the anniversary of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. It's Ralph Waldo Emerson's shot heard around the world. It's considered to be the first battle of the Revolutionary War and thus of American independence. And it's a holiday here in Massachusetts because of all of that. We even get a day extra to pay our taxes to the government because of that. The kids start their spring vacation week on Patriots Day. The Boston Marathon is run on Patriots Day. The Red Sox have their only morning game of the entire season on Patriots Day. It's a pretty big deal. And it's a celebration of change. We were the first in the world to overthrow a king and not replace him with another king, but to instead choose democracy. That change changed the entire world. And we celebrate that change tomorrow on Patriots Day. It was also nice to have a couple of warm days, Friday after work. Cher and I sat out on our deck in the sun with just, you know, shirts on. No coats, no sweaters, no scarves, no gloves. I wore my winter coat again to church this morning. It was nice to have that warm weather come, especially when they're talking about the possibility of freezing rain or snow flurries later on today. So, you know, it's time. It's time for the seasons to change already, to start moving from flurries to shorts. It's the middle of April, for gosh sake. Our music director, as beautiful as our music is, our, our music director, Anthony, is down in Florida because he couldn't take it any longer. And he sent an email to us yesterday saying 80 degrees and sunny just to rub it in that we're still sitting up here in winter. We want change. We need change. But with all of that said, even so, change is hard when it comes to faith. Everywhere else, change seems normal. A little kid grows up to a big kid. You know, seasons change, people change, nations change. It all seems normal. But when you talk about changing of the faith, whoa, that gets pretty scary. Luke tells us this morning, for example, how hard it was even for the apostles to change. The resurrected Jesus appears to them. The Bible says that they were startled. Probably the better word would be terrified. We've talked about this, you know, through Lent and Easter. Can you imagine the guy that you saw dead is now standing in the room with you? The doors are locked, and all of a sudden there, this guy who is dead is standing there? I'd be terrified if my dead mother or dead father showed up in my house back in, in South Deerfield some night. I would love to see them, but I would be terrified if it ever happened. And so these apostles are terrified about the prospect of seeing Jesus there. They think Jesus is only a ghost, and Jesus wants to prove to them that he's for real. He points out the wounds in his hand. He points to the wounds in his feet. He says, come on over here. Feel me. See that I have flesh and bones. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones. So come and see that I am for real. And even with all of this, the Bible can only say, and I think this is an amazing statement, in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. The apostles are there in the room looking at Jesus. And the gospel writer is writing a, a story about faith for other people of faith to help them believe even more. And at the end of his gospel, he says, in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. 
That's a pretty provocative statement when you think about it. When you consider that it's the culmination of a gospel, that these people who are the ones who are witnesses passing on their faith in Jesus to us, that they were disbelieving and they were still wondering, even as they looked at Jesus. So it's hard even for the apostles to change their faith and to be able to believe in Jesus resurrected. And they got to see Jesus with their own eyes. Or take this morning's reading that was shared with us by Amy. Peter and John are keeping to their old traditions. They're going back to the Jerusalem temple for mid-afternoon prayers. All of these people around them, they're not there to hear a Christian message. They are there because of the Jerusalem temple. And there's a crippled man who was begged by the entrance, just asking for a handout here or there, just so that he can survive. Peter and John walk by. The man asks them for a gift, a donation. They have nothing money-wise to give to them, but they give him a priceless gift. The man is healed miraculously, and it is done specifically in the name of Jesus Christ. But then the story continues. Jumping up, he stood, and he began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, Peter and John, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. The miracle was Jesus's. But the crowd would not give Jesus any of the credit. Even the man healed was leaping for joy. He could only say praise to God. He couldn't get across his lips the name Jesus. Peter preached to them about the power of that name, Jesus Christ. But they couldn't say it because it's so hard to change your faith. Usually change is not only normal, it's necessary. But when it comes to faith, we can imagine just the opposite. We can even imagine that change is to be unfaithful. Where we were in the faith is where we always have to be in the faith. Faith is determined by the past. Now, does that sound like that is really the message that any of us want to preach anymore, that faith is determined by the past? Does that sound right to your ear, that maybe where we were is where we always have to be? It doesn't make sense anywhere else. Why does it have to make so much sense in church, where the past is always so much more important than the present or our hopes for the future. What is so special about the past? Doesn't that throw water all over both of today's readings in the Bible? Wouldn't that definition of faith as being more in the past than today prevent the apostles in that upper room from even recognizing Jesus as more than a ghost? Or all of those people at the Jerusalem temple for recognizing that the miracle was in Jesus' name and not just in God's name? Doesn't faith in some way have to be open to Jesus now, when Jesus and God are revealing themselves somehow to us now, that Jesus and God are surprising us now by their presence. Why do we always have to look in the rearview mirror for God? God is here, and God is calling us somewhere into the future, and if we're only looking in the past, in the rearview mirror, we're only going to get into an accident. God isn't concerned so much with the past. God is concerned with where we are right now. Change is a part of it. Change is a part of faith. And this is not a rejection of the past. Remember the reading that Amy said. This is the, Jesus is of the same God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of our ancestors. Jesus is not something new. He's part of that past. Remember that Peter and John, they're on their way to pray in the Jerusalem temple. This is faith building on the past. Or think also to the words of Jesus from today's gospel. It says that Jesus opened their minds to be able to understand the scriptures. It doesn't mean that he rewrote the Old Testament. The words are the same. Nothing changed in the text. What changed was the apostles. The text didn't change. The apostles changed. So that's, again, building on the past. And the passage closes with Jesus telling them, you are witnesses. That is witnesses to that experience, the experience of an awakening, of seeing faith as our own, of letting it change us. And we know this because Luke never bothers to tell us anything at all about Jesus' Bible study class. Wouldn't it have been the coolest thing to be able to, through Luke's pen, to know what Jesus said to those apostles about how he was explained in the Old Testament? As important as that would be, as cool as it would be to hear Jesus' words of Bible study, we never hear a word about that. Because Jesus' words were meant for those apostles, those people, 2,000 years ago, where they were in there now, not for us. 
Those are no longer our battles. We here all accept Jesus as the resurrected Savior. It's not a real big battle for us. So we have moved on, but it was important for them. So the meaningful discussion, it wasn't about the specific texts of the Bible. It was more about the experience, not about Jesus, but of Jesus. How do I experience Jesus? Not what somebody else experienced of Jesus in the past, but how do I experience Jesus now? And how will that experience change us? Change is not bad. Change is natural. It's a part of a living faith. That's why Peter preaches about the name of Jesus. The name makes Jesus personal. Remember that amazing story at Easter where Mary is outside the tomb and she can't recognize the body of Jesus, but as soon as he says her name, she recognizes Jesus. It was personal. It was that name. And that's the same thing when he talks about when Peter and John preach in the name of Jesus Christ. It has to be personal to all of us. You know, the miracle that came and went. We don't even know the name of the man who was healed. He has come. He has gone. The actual person is no longer important to us. It's over and it's done with. But linking that miracle with Jesus, that has the power to change people. So change is not the enemy of faith. Change is a reality of faith. Jesus isn't only calling us to study and remember where he once was. What did the church once do? What was this place like in 1670? That's all wonderful. That's why we're here now. But that's not where Jesus is. Jesus is here right now in 2018. And we have to reach out and find him and grab hold and go along for the ride and see where he's going to lead us. Jesus isn't only calling us to study and remember the past. Jesus calls us to meet him in the present. Maybe it's through the gift of music. I wish I could be like that. I wish I could play the piano. I was a little kid taking piano lessons I gave up. I was terrible. My mother was an operatic singer. I wish I could sing. I can't sing. But I love music. And when I hear beautiful music, it's almost like you can touch God. Or maybe it's through word. Maybe it's through silence. Maybe it's through this community. Maybe it's through the action of the church. Maybe it's completely something different. But somehow, Jesus is going to touch each and every one of us because Jesus is here. And we don't have to worry about so much about what Jesus wants to do. What is Jesus doing now? That means we've got to give him time. We have to give him a little bit of space in our lives. We can't just go through our busy lives and expect Jesus to fit in like he's a 30-second commercial during the Super Bowl. You know, all your efforts in that 30 seconds. Jesus can't do that. Jesus has to give us. We have to give Jesus time so that we can change with Jesus. The past is really important, but it's the present that matters. The past can't be used to limit Jesus. It can't be used to limit us. It can't be used to limit the church. That's the message of today's readings. So let's not be afraid of change. Let us be witnesses to it. Let's look to the horizon for Jesus, not the past, but to the horizon. And let's see what Jesus wants us to become. And let's start thinking of that as being faithful. Is what does Jesus want us to become? Not so much what we were. And for these things may we pray in Jesus' most holy of names. Amen. So now I'm going to mute my microphone and invite all of you to sing along as a blue hymnal number 562, Because He Lives.
channel 57. Would you like to say anything on the mic so we can all recognize your voice? <laughs> so the voice of channel 57 with, the, with us today. So thank you all again for coming out. I know it's not the uh, prettiest of days outside, but it's always nice to be together in God's house and among God's people. Um, as I said, tomorrow is Bible study class. We only have a few people, but if you'd like to come, uh, the Bible is an amazing story that I think a lot of us think we have got down pat. And then when you read it and study it, there's amazing mysteries to behold in there. And uh, one of the things that like, I try to get across in the sermon is that we're getting closer and closer to Pentecost. And Pentecost is the idea that the Spirit comes and the Spirit enlivens the church. So we don't have to only think about once, what once was. The Spirit is the church today. And so that is a huge responsibility because each and every one of us has something to do with the direction of the church. And the Bible is our textbook. And so I would really encourage any and all uh, tomorrow, hopefully the weather will allow, uh, we will be here to study Mark's Gospel, and I do invite you to come and to attend. So if you would with me now turn to our benediction response in the bulletin. Put your trust in God as you face another week. God affirms you and claims your faithfulness. Turn away from vain words and prejudice. Seek the purity of life we find in Christ Jesus. We will open our eyes to the goodness of God. We seek to follow faithfully wherever Christ leads. We pray your promise in sight as we seek His truth. Oh, that we might seek the good of the rest of us. We have been touched here by mystery and by wonder. Let us live as God's beloved people. What we will become has not yet been revealed to us, but we are confident in God's plan for us. So let us leave the sanctuary, and let us leave to be Christ's witnesses out in the world, so that others too may experience the presence and the peace of Christ. Amen.